Please welcome Kirk Schulz, President of Washington State University. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of the conference. And really kind of nice today that we didn't have to jump up and down off the stage. Those of you who were here last night, as I enter my 60th decade, I appreciate the fact we have steps. So I'm Kirk Schultz, <clears throat> president of Washington State University, our state's proud land grant institution. I have the great honor this morning of introducing an exemplary public servant whose longtime service at the Department of Agriculture he is the second longest serving Secretary of Agriculture in American history, he has led to USDA's transformative leadership on food, agriculture, natural resources, rural development, and nutrition. Under Secretary Vilsack's leadership, the Department of Agriculture has been an incredible partner to public and land-grant universities across the country, particularly around our shared goals of first, strengthening rural and historically underserved communities. Second, responding to challenges of climate change. Third, creating good paying jobs and cultivating the next generation of agricultural leaders. And fourth, investing in families and communities. Secretary Vilsack is also spearheading a transformation of the food system by creating better, fairer markets and ensuring that our country's food system is more resilient and more competitive globally. USDA has also doubled down on its commitment to advancing investments in science and research to offer producers a toolbox to adapt to and mitigate climate change. At Washington State University, we have had the honor of hosting the secretary at our Mount Vernon Research and Extension Center, located about uh, 90 minutes uh, north of here, as well as recently on our WSU Pullman campus to celebrate the groundbreaking of a new USDA ARS building which has been the works for two decades. This building represents the incredible partnership WSU enjoys with USDA and our state's agricultural partners. We look forward to the groundbreaking research that will emerge from the students, faculty, and researchers there as they tackle problems facing farmers here in Washington and across the country. On behalf of all of our public and land-grant universities, we thank Secretary Vilsack for his ongoing partnership and leadership. Please join me in giving a warm Washington welcome to Secretary Tom Vilsack. I, I appreciate the steps, too. <laughs> uh, president Schultz, thank you very, very much uh, for that kind introduction. And I just shared with the president that I, too, appreciate the steps. Um, <laughs> And I also appreciate the opportunity to be with you this morning, and I very much appreciate the fact that you are all great champions and advocates for the land-grant university and public university system. Uh, as I just simply shared recently with presidents and chancellors at an earlier breakfast meeting, uh, it is one of the great gifts uh, to this great country that Abraham Lincoln provided in 1862 when he established the land-grant system. You all have been engaged and involved in, in helping over the course of the history of, of not only the land grant system, but also the Department of Agriculture, rural America. And I'm here today uh, in part to challenge every single one of you as champions of rural America uh, to envision a slightly different approach to economic opportunity, a slightly different and complementary approach to agriculture as we know it. Now, in 1981, the Secretary of Agriculture at the time was a fellow by the name of Bob Berglund. Uh, he was from Minnesota, and he was leaving office. Uh, and as he left office, he decided to provide a report on what had taken place over the last 10 years in American agriculture. For in the early 1970s, we shifted from the supply management system of the New Deal, established by then Secretary Henry Wallace, uh, to a more market-orientated deal. Uh, Secretary Butts, if you might remember, uh, often encouraged farmers across the United States to focus on production. He suggested fence row to fence row. And Secretary Berglund was suggesting that as he looked at the, at the trends, he expressed concern about the fact that perhaps this would lead ultimately to larger farms and then fewer farmers. So as I read about this report, 
I thought back to my own experience in the 1980s as a lawyer in a small town in southeast Iowa, representing farmers, farmers who were being foreclosed on uh, during a very difficult time, uh, certainly in the Midwest. I learned at that point in time uh, the significance and importance of small and mid-sized farming operations. I learned that farmers are interested in two things, the opportunity to grow and raise and the opportunity to transfer that opportunity to the next generation. And I saw the impact and the effect that foreclosures had on those farmers. I often say when you ask a farmer what he or she does and they say they are a farmer, that uh, essentially tells you not just what they do but who they are. So I found it a little difficult to take. When I decided to do some research, our folks at uh, the uh, Economic Research Service provided me numbers, and I asked the question, well, how many fewer farmers, farms do we have since 1981, since Bob Berglund issued that challenge and that concern? Well, it turns out that we have 437,300 fewer farms today than in 1981, in the lifetime of most of the people in this room. Are you okay with that? How many farms is that? Well, it's every farm today in Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Colorado. Now, in addition to the loss of those farms, the ERS also reported that we had 141 million fewer acres in farming today than in 1981. Are you okay with that? To give you a sense of how many acres that is, that's Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Maryland, the entire land mass of those states. Are you okay with it? You see, when you lose farms and you lose farm land, it has an impact not just on that farm family, but it also the impact on the community in which they live. Fewer farmers mean fewer kids in schools. So schools merge. Fewer farm families and fewer kids in school mean fewer customers for that small business in the downtown area, the central business district of that small town. And those businesses close up and you have a dollar store and a Walmart. Fewer small businesses and fewer customers means you have fewer patients at that hospital. It becomes tougher to keep the doc and that hospital becomes a clinic. And eventually what happens around coffee tables and dinner tables in rural America is a conversation between moms and dads and their children and grandkids about how it's not possible to make it work. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with the consequence to our country when those small towns diminish and their population shrinks and poverty rates go up and we have fewer young people who understand the significance of giving back to country? because a disproportionate number of those who represent us and, and defend us in, in, in the military come from those small towns. Are you okay with the diminishment of our national security? If you're not okay with any of that, you have to ask the question, well, what can we do about it? That question was asked of Secretary Perdue, who uh, was my successor and predecessor, and, and, and he answered it very truthfully. He said, well, in the United States, our, our system is pretty, pretty simple. You either get big or you get out. Are we okay with that? Well, the notion of getting big obviously requires you to have access to resources to be able to get big. Here's an additional problem. Last year, record farm income, best year in the history of the United States. Never had more farm income than last year. If you look at who received that income, what you're going to find is that 7.5% of our farms, these are farms that sell more than $500,000 in sales annually. There are about 150,000 farms out of 2.1 million or so. They got 89% of the income, which means the other 92% shared 11%, which explains why nearly 50% of our farms didn't make any money, and the other 40% or so made money, but the majority of money they made came from off-farm income. They have to work two jobs or more 
to keep the farm. Are we okay with that? I, for one, am not. I know President Biden is not. So when we talked about this department and its responsibility to rule America, the charge to us was to make a difference. The charge to us was to use the American Rescue Plan, the infrastructure law, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and any other tool we had to try to address this issue to provide greater opportunity for all farms of all sizes and all types of operations and all types of operators. The charge to us was create a companion system. Do we need production agriculture? Absolutely. Have the land-grant university systems been supportive of production agriculture? Unbelievably so. The productivity level of American agriculture, because of the work that's been done in part on land-grant universities and public universities, astounding, amazing. But we forgot about the companion system that needs to be in place for those who wish to remain small and mid-sized. Well, what could that system be? It, it can't be a system that's focused on just productivity. It has to be a system that's also focused on profitability. And by profitability, I don't just mean selling a, a, a single commodity. I'm talking about multiple streams of revenue coming into that same farming operation in addition to what they get from selling a crop or livestock or government payment. So we have gone about the last several years at USDA to help create a companion system that complements production agriculture, that creates new opportunities. And let me briefly explain what that system is. Obviously, at the, at the center of it is the farm or the forest because this is equally true of those who uh, are in the forest business. The question is, can we create additional revenue streams that are coming in simultaneously with more new and better market opportunities? The first area we looked at was the notion of climate smart agriculture. Was there a way in which we could encourage farmers, ranchers, and producers to embrace climate practices, reduce greenhouse gas, emissions and sequester more carbon and in doing so make more money. So we established through the Commodity Credit Corporation a $3 billion fund, 141 projects, every major commodity, every state, 175 practices, and we're paying farmers today in concert with land-grant universities, minority-serving institutions, we're paying farmers to embrace climate-smart practices to de-risk, to reduce the risk, to eliminate the financial risk of adoption. We're ensuring that all farmers of all sizes and all commodities participate. In addition to paying the farmers, we're also creating a premium, a premium price for what they're growing. So instead of just organic at high value and commodity at low value, there's now a climate smart agricultural commodity in the middle. This is additional, a new value added income opportunity. We're going to measure and we're going to monitor and we're going to report and verify with the assistance and help of the universities in this room and others, the results of these climate practices. We're investing $300 million in that effort, working with all of you. Those resources are going to allow us then to essentially allow farmers who are involved with this to participate in what are called ecosystem service markets. These are carbon markets, water markets, biodiversity markets. These are markets that will pay farmers for the results they are getting. Why? Because farms have the capacity and forested areas have the capacity to get to a net zero or below a negative carbon footprint a negative greenhouse gas footprint. And there are industries that can't get there, that are going to pay farmers to allow them to also get to a net zero future. This is a new income opportunity. Part of this climate smart agriculture 
is conversion of agricultural waste and residue into something more valuable. There are literally 40,000 bioproducts in the marketplace today that can be made from agricultural residue. Uh, envision a dairy farm taking its manure, separating the water and solids, reclaiming the water, particularly in western areas where water is scarce, extracting from that water potentially organic material that might have some value, understand that then the solids can be pelletized and then sent to a manufacturing and processing facility where they can be converted into a multitude of these products, including a brand new opportunity of sustainable aviation fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel, it's a 36 billion gallon industry that doesn't exist today. It's twice the size of the current biofuel industry. An industry that supports 400,000 jobs. An industry that provides uh, uh, alternatives uh, to regular gas that lowers costs for consumers. The aviation industry needs a low carbon fuel. We're not going to have battery powered planes. We're not going to have hydrogen powered planes for long distance in the near future. This is an enormous opportunity. You can not only take manure and, take, <laughs> and turn it into sustainable aviation fuel, you can do just about anything, including woody biomass. So as we reduce the hazard of wildfire in the West, we can create a whole new industry that supports million, a million jobs. And in doing so, we create a new income opportunity for farmers. So that's a climate smart effort. In addition to climate smart, we're also committed to renewable energy. The IRA, the, Invi the Inflation Reduction Act, has three new programs, three significant commitments, two new programs. The REAP program, we're all familiar with, it provides resources to farmers to basically embrace renewable energy on the farm. It lowers their costs. That's good for the bottom line. But in addition, it also potentially creates excess energy beyond what the farm needs. In many states, that excess energy is currently wasted. But we're asking RECs and municipal utilities to embrace renewable energy and to transition away from an over-reliance on fossil fuel generation to a more balanced approach. Where are they going to get that renewable energy? Why can't we figure out ways in which those farmers can take those REAP dollars and band together in a cooperative effort to provide their excess energy to that REC that's making that conversion? There is over $11 billion invested in this program under the IRA. We think it will leverage at least another uh, $10 billion. Enormous opportunity for a new income source for farmers. This bottom row is dedicated to local and regional food systems. That's the notion where the farmer local and regional food systems. That's, that's the notion where the farmer basically negotiates directly with their customer. Why do we do this? Here's why. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a dollar's worth of whatever, a farmer gets about 18 cents of every dollar. When you're engaged in a local and regional food system, the farmer can get as high as 50 to 75 cents of every food dollar. It's a much better deal because you're eliminating the middleman. And conceivably, those who are purchasing from local and regional food systems may also gain a savings because the middlemen are eliminated or reduced. So we're investing in farm to school, farm to table. We're investing in local food purchasing arrangements with schools and food banks, uh, with secretaries, directors, and commissioners of agriculture to use those resources we're providing to be able to uh, purchase from local and regional food systems. And we've created a series of 12 regional food business centers located across the United States, several of them at land-grant universities, in which we are creating the financial and technical assistance to establish more of these. We've also provided every secretary, commissioner, and director of agriculture across the United States literally millions of dollars, a resource under the Resilient Food Infrastructure Program to basically invest in the supply chain needs of that local and regional food system. So as land-grant universities are looking for partnerships and opportunities, they ought to be looking at that resilient food infrastructure program. We've not only increased processing opportunities when it comes to non-meat and poultry, but we've also invested nearly a billion dollars 
of American Rescue Plan resources in additional processing capacity. Uh, nearly 400 projects have already been funded. There's another round of, of uh, small and tribal uh, processing opportunities that are going to be announced uh, relatively soon. And then there's an, a second wave of expanded and process, uh, expanded and new processing capacity that will be announced in 2024. So uh, just to give you a, a rundown, there's $3 billion here. The tax credits for sustainable aviation fuel and the grand challenge, $4 billion. This is $11 billion plus. This is $1 billion. This is $2 billion. And we've also put money into additional procurement opportunities as secretaries and commissioners of agriculture basically fund food banks, schools. We just recently invested over $2 billion in this effort. We recognize a challenge with fertilizer. Many land-grant universities are, are currently are, are currently uh, engaged in research in terms of tr figuring out ways in which we can better utilize fertilizer with sensor technology, understand that some acres may not require much, if any. We're looking at alternatives, and we're looking at manufacturing of our own fertilizer being less reliant on Russian and Belarus fertilizer. We're investing $900 million in this initiative. There are 92 projects that will likely get funded here. This is a new income opportunity. These are new income opportunities and better markets. And this is a more competitive and better market. So instead of just relying on the sale of commodities, you've got a climate smart premium, you've got an ecosystem service market, you've got waste product that now becomes an ingredient and a new commodity, you've got energy you can sell, you've got a better uh, opportunity in your local processing, you've got a local and regional food system opportunities where you get a better, uh, better deal, you've got procurement, and you've got lower fertilizer costs. This is a system that over the next three to five years, $20 billion will be invested. So the question then is, how can you help? How can you create opportunity? How can you leverage those resources? How can you multiply the impact and how can you set the table, not for the Farm Bill today, but the Farm Bill five years from now? Well, first of all, I think it's important for land-grant universities to look at ways in which their resources can be supportive of and encourage young people to think about every one of these boxes. I think you have extension programs that are vitally important in getting word out about opportunities that exist in every one of these boxes. I think you have a disproportionate voice in your respective states with your political leadership at both the federal, state, and local level. There's no reason why this can't be replicated at the state level, and some states are already doing that. So that you have not just the federal system in investment, but a state and local investment as well. You can ensure that the resources and the the programs that are currently helping this remain so. Making sure the Farm Bill continues to support local and regional food systems, which I believe it will. Making sure that the IRA resources for both conservation and renewable energy are preserved and not taken for some other purpose. Making sure the Secretary of Agriculture, whoever he or she may be, has the capacity to use the Commodity Credit Corporation in a creative way making sure that you do what you can to encourage farm organizations in your respective states to also work with their membership to embrace this companion effort. It does not have to be contrary or in opposition to production agriculture. It is creating an entrepreneurial option to get big or get out. It is creating a sense that there is real opportunity for moms and dads and grandparents to be able to say truthfully, we can make it work. It's creating avenues and openings 
for farmers to understand how to access all of this. We have partnerships here with major farm organizations, major conservation groups, major environmental groups, major retailers, major food processing companies, major forested uh, landowner. Those partnerships create the vehicle through which the land grant can work to create an awareness of this and this. You've got economic development folks in your states who understand this, and you do too. You've got some of your own professors working on the research that creates this, so you can figure out ways in which you can get your farm organizations and commodity groups to embrace. You can bring in the RECs from your respective uh, states, then local small municipal utilities, convene them. You've got convening power. You've got the ability to help provide technical assistance as we are and workforce development for these processing opportunities. Part of what we did here was also create a re-lending uh, uh, effort so if processors need credit, they have a, a place to go. You can certainly understand and bring and convene food banks, schools that understand the concept of local and regional food systems. You can make sure your commissioner of agriculture, your secretary, your director understands and appreciates the necessity of continuing to invest in local and regional food systems with these billions of dollars that they now have. And you can continue your work in collaboration with the 92 projects that we're going to fund to reduce fertilizer costs and to create new opportunities. All of these, by the way, are job creators. Every single one of them, job creators in rural places. If we don't do this, and we are able to convene, and I probably won't be here, but many of you will be 40 years from now. That's the hope anyway. Are you going to be OK if we don't do this? Is the next secretary advising you that we've lost yet another 400,000 farms? I don't think so. I think you understand this is a pivotal moment. About every 60, 70 years in agriculture, we get to one of those pivotal transformational moments. And you happen to be the generation and the leadership at the intersection of that pivotal moment. And the question is whether we're going to take full advantage of it. I'm confident that you will. I'm confident in the land-grant system because I think Abe Lincoln's vision of the land-grant system was right. And I shared this with the uh, chancellors and presidents earlier. You're the system that looks around the corner. You're the system that understands the future before the rest of us understand it and help us embrace and understand and appreciate the future. This is very consistent with that around the corner responsibility. Now let me finish with this in terms of why this is important. I mentioned it earlier, but I want to put a, 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 a specific point on it. I mentioned the fact that a disproportionate number of men and women serve in the military that come from these small towns. And the reason I believe that that's the case is because when they grow up in an area that is agriculturally oriented, and forestry oriented. They see farmers and forested landowners continuing to reinvest, continuing to put something back into the land, to replenish it, to renourish it. And they understand that something of value that gives to us requires us to give something back. So they look for service. You can find no better example of this than the men and women who serve in our National Guard. Extraordinary people. And I often tell the story of when I was governor of the fact that during the Iraq and Afghan war, unfortunately and tragically, sometimes folks didn't come back. And the responsibility of a governor or leader at that point in time as the leader of the National Guard was to extend condolences. Uh, it's the 20th anniversary of the death of Sergeant Bruce Smith from Iowa. Uh, Bruce was a 20-year a veteran of the National Guard. He was called to active duty not once, not twice, but three times to go into that battle zone. He did so willingly. He left his wife and two children, went off to war, 
was in charge of operating a helicopter in Baghdad to, sh to ferry uh, soldiers from one neighborhood to the other because it was too dangerous to drive. On a, uh, 20 years ago, the helicopter he was uh, uh, flying was hit with a handheld missile. And as it was going down, Bruce and his co-pilot had the opportunity to maneuver it just a bit so that they could increase the risk for themselves but save the people on board or increase the risk for the folks on board and potentially save themselves. He and the co-pilot did what they were trained to do, what you would expect them to do. They put themselves at risk. He died. The co-pilot died. 17 people lived. I call his widow. There are no words in a circumstance like that. And I share with her condolences, and I'm, I'm fumbling around. She stops me in mid-sentence, and she says, Governor, I, I, I've got this figured out. And I thought to myself, how amazing is that? She's got it figured out. 24 hours ago, she learned that her husband of 20 years is gone. She's going to have to raise these two kids by herself. She said, the way I've got it figured, Bruce needed those 17 people more in that split second than I'll need him the rest of my life. Now, these are two people from a small town in Iowa. Bruce was a patriot. He understood this country required people to sacrifice, to go over and put themselves at risk. And he willingly did so because of that value system. His wife, Mrs. Smith, understood that at times the country asked for a disproportionate amount of sacrifice from some. And she too was willing to do it because the country was that important. So when I talk about this, I'm not just talking about farm families. I'm talking about rural families and the importance and necessity of providing them hope and opportunity. I hope you feel the same way. Thank you all very much.